Nkrumo Media's Polity Amtabi Madiba, independent writer and researcher Hain Marais, joins me to discuss his book titled In the Balance, The Case for a Universal Basic Income in South Africa and Beyond. Your book sends out the debate about a universal basic income in the wider context of the dispossessing pressures of capitalism and the turmoil of global warming, pandemics, and social upheaval. So can you briefly talk to us more on how a universal basic income could be a way through the crisis? We can look at this in, in two ways. One is at a global level. And the other, which is what the book focuses on for a good part, is in the context of South Africa, specifically globally, we're living through an era of, of accumulating crises. We have the effects of global warming. We have economic instability, financial crises. We have the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, and scientists tell us there'll be more coming down the tube as well. And this happens in a context where the employment rate, the number of people who actually can find decent paid work, tends to be declining in most of the regions of the world. So there's an increasing need for some other form of income and social support out there, which is becoming more and more visible and obvious to the policymakers and, of course, to the people living in these circumstances as well. If we look at South Africa in particular, at our predicament here, it's as if these, these trends that we're starting to see happen globally have already happened here. It's as if we are living in some kind of dystopia. We have, if we count people who've given up on looking for work, 45%, 46% of people are out of paid work. We know that a third of people who do have work in South Africa live below the poverty level. So we have a, a, a dual crisis here. People cannot find work, but they live in a system where you have to work. You have to earn a wage or a salary in order to have any prospect of a decent life. And you have people who do find work, but it's so intermittent, it's so poorly paid, it's so insecure that they cannot escape poverty themselves and they can't enable their kids to escape it either. So it's, it's this, this turning series of, of, of precarity and, and, and anxiety and impoverishment that many, many millions of South Africans are trapped in. That's the reality we're living with. Can a UBI, a universal basic income, solve that in, in wealth, one fell swoop? If we can afford one, the answer is yes. We know, for example, that if we were to be able to pay a monthly income to all South Africans, all adult South Africans, of roughly the upper poverty level, which is set by Statistics South Africa, it's about 1,300 rands a month, we will, within five years, absolutely eradicate poverty in South Africa. The question is, can we afford it? And do we want to afford it? And these are, I think, the big things that we have to wrestle with as we discuss this option in, in the months and years going ahead. And you place the need for a universal basic income in the context of the crisis of unemployment, also pointing out the condition of cross inequality, social entitlement, and radical wealth distribution. Can you tell us more on this? The reality we face in South Africa, and we know different from any other country in the capitalist world, is we have to work. We are, we are expected and required to work for a wage or a salary. And that, in a sense, gives us our passport, our entry into society. That's how we see ourselves, and society sees ourselves as becoming fully-fledged citizens with rights and entitlements and claims on the state and on others. So that's the ideological uh, understanding, this world of values in which we live, and we are expected to, to, uh, to introduce ourselves. The reality is that that prospect of earning a wage or a salary is simply not available in South Africa to close to half of the adult working age population. So we have an economy that is structured, has evolved in ways that enable it to produce vast wealth, but it doesn't need it. practically half of the workers in the country, in that economy. There's something fundamentally wrong and out of, out, out of whack in a situation like that. So we have two problems standing next to each other. The one is a misshapen, a misstructured economy that works fairly well. And we know that by looking at the wealth and the, and the riches that are generated, that works fairly well, but for a tiny minority of society. And it does that without need for most of the workers in that society. And there's no prospect, there's absolutely no evidence saying 
but pointing to a different type of economy based on the kinds of policies that we've been following and so forth. So that's the one reality. The other is the social crisis that this has created. And it's a crisis of poverty and inequality, as you've just mentioned. We, we know, for example, that roughly 40 to 45 percent of income earners in South Africa own no measurable assets. They have nothing. In other words, most of them are probably in debt or they have zero assets that they can count towards their wealth, for example. So that's, that's the social reality we have. That cannot continue for any length of time. We saw this last July with the riots, instigated or not, but what boiled up there was sheer frustration and, and desperation as well. And this will happen again and again in our society here. So what we absolutely have to start searching for are economic and social policy strategies that can deal with this fundamental reality, which is that waged work, the expectation of going out and finding work is not a guarantee of having a remotely dignified life for you and your family, for tens of millions of South Africans. We cannot continue with this fantasy that all we have to do is create more jobs. We have no evidence in our history, and we can go back decades looking for it. We find no evidence that the strategies that have been followed thus far during the apartheid era and after the apartheid era have created a society where full employment is a remote possibility. We have to confront this. And my argument that I try and make in the book is that a universal basic income is one element of a possible solution to this predicament, to this crisis. It does not solve all of the problems, but it is a fundamental part of a, of a suite and ensemble of, of changes that we have to start introducing in our society. So, Mr. Marais, how relevant is the universal basic income to the economic ecological, social, and political crisis? I think it can be incredibly relevant to the social crisis. As I mentioned, if we can afford to pay a monthly income, a guaranteed income, to all adults in South Africa, measured at the upper poverty line, we will be able to rem completely remove the poverty gap in South Africa. In other words, there will be no South Africans living below the poverty line at that point. So this, at the level of addressing the social crisis, it has enormous appeal. It has appeal in economic terms as well, because we know from economic theory and reality that when low-income families, households, and individuals get extra income, they tend to spend it. There's very little latitude for saving it and sticking it away as much as they would like to try and save for the future. The needs are just so great. So you have this infusion of money into the economy as well. Most of that is spent on goods and services which are locally produced and often locally owned as well. So we're talking about foodstuffs, basic clothing, uh, materials for the kids who are going to school, transport, and so on. So this money that goes into households by way of a, a basic income ends up going straight into the economy as well. So it has the potential of generating job growth generating economic growth. And because these are not expensive goods, we're not talking about buying cars or you know, flat screen TVs and things for the most part, they tend to be produced in South Africa as well. So it has a, an important kick on effect in the economy as well. In terms of its impact on us dealing with the ecological crisis that we're facing and beginning to experience, I think there we can see it as one of the cushions, one of the safety net factors or features that we need to introduce as we transition to an economy that is less reliant on fossil fuels, less of a carbon-based economy than we have right now. What we know for sure is that the process of transition, of moving away from, for example, coal-based electricity generation, of moving away from extractive mining as one of the mainstays of our electricity, of our energy mix, is going to require disruption in the lives of the people who work in those industries right now and the communities that rely on them. So we have to find ways in which to support them as they make this transition as well. And it's not enough to simply promise people of retraining, reskilling for more jobs somewhere down the line. People need that sense of security that tomorrow, next week, when they have to buy food, they have to buy books for their kids, they have to pay for the taxi to get them wherever they have to be, work, clinic, whatever, 
they are going to have some money that contributes to that. And that's where a basic income, I think, comes in. And poverty remains widespread and is concentrated disproportionately among Black African majority. So can you talk to us more about the crisis of paid work? The crisis of paid work is, is effectively uh, the reality that, that we live in an ideology, in a, in a world of, of values that associate the act of working for a wage or a salary with our sense of self-esteem, a sense of meaning, our sense of having a claim on each other, certainly having a claim on the state for forms of support. But most of all, it is the only way available to us right now, besides borrowing, to afford basic needs of life. It's in crisis because we live in an economy in South Africa. Here we have it in an extreme way. We live in an economy that denies close to half of the working age adult population had ability to work for this wage and salary. So there's, there's, there's such a fundamental contradiction there. On the one hand, you are told and you learn to believe as well that the only way in which you have any rightful claim on the means for life is by working for a wage. And you have an economy that's structured in ways that means it doesn't need your work. It doesn't need to pay you a wage for your work. In the background, people work, of course, especially women. Women raise children, they run communities, they run operations and organizations, they keep their communities alive and they reproduce their families and communities in that way, but they don't get paid for that. We have a population that works all the time, but only about half of it gets paid for that work. And that's the other problem with with this ideology of of paid work that we've become so steeped in, is that it doesn't recognize all of the unpaid work that happens in society, most of it performed by women. It takes this as a, as a kind of free gift, which somehow the economy and certainly the people making a profit in the economy have a claim to. In the same way that we assume the air that we breathe is free and we have a right to it, or the earth that we, that we end up digging and turning into mines is free and we have a right to it. There's a fundamental contradiction involved in the way we think about how a South African today has, we call it earns, the right to a dignified life, the means to a dignified life, and the opportunities that the economy provides a South African to enter into this deal, which is I sell my labor, I work for you, you pay me back. That has to, has to change. It, it is absolutely unsustainable beyond the fact that it is so obviously unjust and causes such incredible misery and suffering which is utterly, utterly avoidable. We live in the second or third, depending on whose count we trust, the second or third richest economy in the continent of Africa. But we live with the worst inequality on the continent, and we live with massive, massive poverty and immiseration. There's something fundamentally wrong there. And I argue in the book that there are ways around it. The UBI is one element of that. But I also set out in one of the final chapters some of the economic policy changes that we have to start considering that will have to accompany this, this journey into hopefully a society that does justice to the people who live, who grow up and live in it. And you're right that introducing and defending a universal basic income requires political conditions that are potentially transformative. Can you briefly expand on this? It is a tough area to, to consider. The The reality we have to face here is that the demand for a universal basic income is one which has seldom taken root in a broad-based popular way. 20 years or so ago, we had a similar push for a basic income grant in South Africa. It was driven by NGOs, church groups, some trade union support and so on, but it didn't really mature and grow into a mass-driven demand. So it tended to happen at the level of policymakers, think tanks, and the NGOs that, that campaign around the kinds of proposals that emerged from that world there. This hasn't really changed anywhere in the world. And this is a fundamental challenge for the demand of the UBI. Most definitely, there is much greater support for it. When you look at opinion polls and surveys done, especially during the COVID 
pandemic. In Europe, for example, in some countries, opinion polls show 50 to 60 percent of people polled supporting a universal basic income. But that's not exactly the same as having a mass movement driving that demand. It's a very important factor that you have a majority of people supporting the demand. But what you need is some kind of, of political means, some political momentum to shape and drive forth that demand. That is starting to happen in South Africa right now. We have a coalition of upward of 40 NGOs, popular grass-based organizations, church groups, campaigning NGOs, some trade union support as well, that have come together around this demand for a universal basic income. And their challenge right now is to convince politicians, the policymakers, and the people who start crunching the numbers about what sort of UBI is realistic, is feasible. Their job is to convince them that the kind of universal basic income they demand, which is a universal basic income, and that is pay will pay an amount that is not completely negligible, that that type of universal basic income is the one that we should be developing and, and drafting and designing policies for. This is a process that's starting in South Africa right now, but we also know that it enjoys both a little bit of support within government, in the social Department of Social Development, for example, there is support for this type of demand. We saw it in the Green Paper that came out last August, I believe, and that they had to retract because of, um, shall we say, disagreements within government. But we also know there's enormous resistance. There's enormous resistance in particular from the National Treasury, from the Finance Ministry, and from probably some other sectors in government as well, where this old idea of grants being something you give people a handout still holds forth. It still seems to, to shape the way in which a lot of the thinking within government is happening. A lot of the thinking around what social policy should look like in a society like South Africa. We have these outmoded notions that, as I was saying a minute ago, people should work for a living that refuse to confront the fact that it, that work is simply not available there. We have that alongside this idea, well, if you, if you can't find work for now, we're going to have job creation programs and we're going to have some reskilling and retraining and we'll tweak a little bit in our economic policies and we'll give you a little bit of support. Handouts, it's called. And, they, and unfortunately, a lot of people still insist on calling it that. The attitude that the coalition I just described the Ubik Now Coalition and others takes to this is not to see it as a handout, not to see it as something that the state or government grants South Africans. It is an entitlement. It is a rightful claim that they have on the riches that our society produces. And that's a big political challenge. That's a big claim to be making on a system. And lastly, corruption was staged and spending irregularities were witnessed on the SASA grants and during the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa. So how would the universal basic income sidestep these problems? One of the features of a universal basic income is that it is universal. It's paid to everybody that you decide is eligible for it. So if we take it at face value, a universal basic income would be paid to Ideally, everybody in society, but reality means that's not necessarily affordable. So let's say every adult between the ages of 18 and 59. What that means is you aren't doing any means testing. In other words, you're not checking to see whether somebody's income is above or below some set level before deciding that they can get this income, which, for example, is something quite common to cash transfer programs. And you're also not targeting it in the sense that you're not saying this is only for unemployed workers or mothers of children or people of a particular narrow age bracket, for example. And you're also not making it conditional. You're not saying that in order to get this, you have to prove that uh, your children are attending school or you visited a clinic recently or you are working on some job public works program. So it's universal in the sense that it's either means tested it's neither targeted, it's neither conditional. Each of those types of features or, or, or added complications, being targeted, means tested, or conditional, adds administrative cost and administrative complexity and creates 
the opportunities both for mismanaging such a program and for corruption to occur in it. What happened during with the COVID-19 emergency grants was it, these grants were so narrowly targeted and so means tested that the, the, the database for deciding whether a person is eligible or not was often out of date. And these are difficult data sets to keep up to date as well to, in the defense of, of, the, uh, of the agencies who are required to do that. But they were working with out-of-date information. That information changes all the time as well. So if we decide that somebody with an income of, say, less than, for argument's sake, 500 rands a month should be able to access such an income, people's income changes. When you are that poor, there are months where you have nothing. There are months where you manage to borrow from somebody. There are months where you manage to work a little bit. And you're having to report this to some agency constantly. And then it takes months for them to update your status in there and decide, oh, you can get the, the income grant right now. Uh, universal basic income circumvents those types of problems as well. It also circumvents the, the stigma that's attached, the, the humiliation of having to prove that you're poor to some faceless individual often sitting at the other end of a, of a computer program. And that's the other thing that's kicked in here. A lot of this has to happen via the internet, basically. People are required to somehow find access to a computer with a connection to an internet and input data, which is, in my own experience of trying to register on some of these platforms, not for, for income grant support, but for other institutions, not an easy process. So built into the current forms of grant provision in South Africa, our current social policy, are all these numerous steps and opportunities for delay, for missing people who actually need the money, for uh, stigmatizing them, for making it very difficult for them to even access the system that enables them to access this money. And on top of that, for poor governance and corruption as well. The universal basic income requires at root a very basic set of information. It requires a population register, which we do have in South Africa, one of the most sophisticated ones in the continent. And it requires updating that with immigration and emigration data and birth and death data. It doesn't require knowing whether you're paying taxes or not, knowing what your income is, none of that. So in, in that sense, it circumvents many of these problems. The agency that would be required to manage it is something which would be, have to be discussed given the problems that we've had with SASA, not all of which were intrinsic to that, that institution, that structure. There were many human-related malfunctionings that have plagued SASA as well, all of which I believe are, are reparable, all of which can be remedied and fixed in the South African context. That was Hain Marais speaking to Prima Media's Polity about In the Balance the case for a universal basic income in South Africa and beyond.